Hello, my name is Wolfgang Thiem. I'm the father of Dominic. He's actually the number three in the ATP rankings. Together with uh, Top Level Tennis, we will talk today about some interesting topics. Our first uh, topic will be the role of the parents. When I decided, or my wife and me, when we decided, or we forced our, our kids uh, to play tennis, the main point was that uh, I wanted my kids to, to commit to something, to do something, to have something in which they are better than the other kids. Because I think, uh, especially today, it's very important that uh, the kids, uh, when they grow up, they, they learn to have a self-discipline, they have something on which they have to concentrate, on which they have to commit. The parents, they always, they have a very, very, very important role in the career of a kid's tennis. They bring the kids on court, first of all. Then uh, when the kids are younger, they pick the coach for the kids. This is not always easy to find out the right coach. They have to travel with them on the first tournaments. They have to figure out how is the best combination between school and tennis. I remember when, when Dominic started with the school, it was always a big fight because he, he had to go to some tournaments, he had to go to practice. It was not easy to, to explain to the teachers that uh, we need some free time to go to some tournaments, to practice. And later on, with 14, 15, when you play on Tennis Europe, you need more time to travel, you have less time for school. And uh, there, the parents, they have to find a right mix between school and sport, and they, they have to guide the kids through all this time. When the kids become 15, 16, then perhaps the parents, they should step back in the second row, because uh, then there is a coach who spends most of the time with the kid or with the young player, they practice together, they travel together. The coach should be a person which the young player trusts 100%, but the parents, they should always be behind and support. They should always be positive. They should always commit. They should always say, okay, we, we support you whenever you need something, whenever you, you have some problems, come to us. This is, this is the role of the parents in, in this age. I think one of the biggest mistakes parents can make is when already in a younger age, they're forcing the kids to go to tournaments, to, to get a certain ranking, to, to win, to be very negative when the kids are not succeeding. There are many reasons. Sometimes they are body-wise not good enough. Sometimes you have, you have, your, you have opponents, they have the ability to, to concentrate for two, three hours. When 12-year-old kid has the ability to concentrate for two, three hours, for sure he will, he will be one of the best ones. And the parents, as I said, it's so important that they always support the kids, they always have to be positive, and they have to be behind the kid. And whenever the kids they need something, the parents should step in the first row and then uh, guide the kid uh, through, through, different, uh, through different periods. One of the most important things in the career uh, of a tennis player is uh, to pick up the right, uh, the right coach. I divide into a tennis teacher, into a tennis coach. Uh, first, if uh, a kid if, or if kids starts to play tennis, they need a good tennis teacher to have a very good experience in uh, technical practice, because uh, when kids start playing tennis, uh, they need uh, to get the basics, they need to get the perfect technique, they, they need to get the skills. And uh, you need uh, tennis teachers, which uh, are experienced in the different age groups. First of all, uh, try to pick up a very good kids coach. A kids coach is someone who gives them a lot of fun of court. The kids are practicing in groups until they are eight, nine years. They should enjoy. And then when you have the feeling that uh, 
they want to practice more, that they want to go deeper into the sport. Then you try to pick up a coach which can guide the kid from 10 to, let's say, Uh, 14, 15, and this is one of the most important times of uh, in, the, in the career of a, of, of a tennis player because this is the time where you have to give them the perfect technical base. And the coach in this age group, he has to have a vision how these kids uh, should play when they are 17 or 18. Sometimes it's interesting uh, how tall they become, how they think on court, uh, how they understand the game. And all this has to fit in a picture and uh, the coach has to, has to work into this direction. But it's always very, very important that, uh, that you work on a perfect technical pace. So until 14 or 15, they have to have a perfect forehand, a perfect backhand, a perfect serve. A good volley, a good slice, perhaps this is something that comes a little bit later. But these three main shots, they have to be perfect fixed until 14 or 15. And then the time will bring more tournaments. The players will have not that much time on the pace. They will travel more. They, will, uh, they are more in other countries. And then you can think about uh, to take a coach. Because a coach is someone who is experienced in, in tournaments, who is experienced in traveling, who knows the other players, who, who can give the player information about the opponents. In general, I would say a good coach gives the player what he needs and not what he wants. This is one very important sentence. Because today, the coaches, they always try To, to, to make the players happy. But in the end, the coach has to make the players successful. This is important. The job of the federation should be to have a national center, if the country is bigger, of course, to have some, 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 some local centers. But I think that the best players, they have a better chance to increase or to develop when they are practicing together. We have today, we have a lot of very, very good academies, good coaches. But for me, the federation plays a big role because they have to have uh, very good national centers, uh, very good local centers where the players can go. And there they have the guarantee that they are working good coaches. It's like in football. If you play football and you go to a good club, there's, from my point of view, there's the guarantee that Good coaches are working there. In tennis, sometimes, I know it from Austria, for example, if you are unlucky, you pick up the wrong coach and you cannot go for your full potential. My wife and me, we had a tennis school in Austria in 1993, we started. Uh, Dominic was born in 93, and I think the first time he came with us on court was uh, 94. He could barely run, but uh, he was already on court. From the first day, uh, he loved, he loved everything where was a ball included. Doesn't matter if it was tennis or football. He spent hours on the court. So especially in the summer month, he spent so many hours uh, on, 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 on court, on, on club and at the club. And he always came to the tennis camps with, uh, with my wife and me. And uh, when we came at home, he took the racket and he played against the garage tour or against the wall. Every day, many, many hours with the racket and with a ball. We never had uh, the goal that he should become a professional tennis player. I mean, we enjoyed it that uh, we had the whole day our kid with us, and this was for us the, the, the most important point. Dominic was, was very talented in all the sports where was a ball included. Also today, he loves every sport with a ball. I mean, he was never a good swimmer or he was never, never good in, 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 in riding a bike until today. Otherwise, I think uh, you, cannot, you cannot make it. When Dominic became five or six years, we realized uh, that uh, he, he, really, he really loves tennis. And uh, 
I started to to practice a little bit more with him. At this time, I was uh, was working in a in an academy in Vienna, and uh, Dominic had a coach uh, where he was practicing two times a week. Then I think when he was eight years or nine years, uh, he practiced already four times a week. I remember his first international tournament. He played in 2003 in Croatia. He won the tournament. He got an invitation to the States. I went with him to Texas and uh, they played uh, uh, an event against the uh, 10-year-old kids. Then when he was he was 12 year old, he started uh, to play international. He played uh, the Orange Bowl. We traveled to, to Florida. His development always went, I would say, constantly, constantly up. Under 14, he uh, he had uh, two problems. The first problem that when he was 12, we changed uh, to a one-handed backhand. And uh, the second is that he was body-wise not really big. But he played some really good tournaments. And I remember in uh, under 14 Tennis Europe, he was ranked at around uh, 30. And uh, we were really happy at this time. And then, you know, when he became 15, Body-wise, he grew up and uh, he became more equal to the other players. Suddenly, he was able to compete with the with the good ones, with the really good players. Uh, Tennis Europe under 16, he finished, I think, with number six or seven, starting then uh, ITF Junior tournaments. Uh, I remember it was in 2010, he went to a trip to South America for seven weeks and he won there two Category 1 tournaments. And suddenly he was top 10 in the ITF Juniors. It was in uh, 2010 where he played uh, his uh, first Grand Slam tournament in French Open. Uh, Super nice memories. I I went with him there. I mean, he lost first round, but it was such a nice experience to be be part of such a, a big tournament. In the next month, he played also Wimbledon. I think he, he also lost first round. Uh, then at the end of the year, we went to the States and the first Mexico and then to the States. And he won one category, one tournament. And then he won first time Eddie Hare. And suddenly he was number two in the world. And in 2011, he he was seeded number two at uh, at Australian Open. So it was amazing. And uh, we we were traveling to, to Australia first time. And then he played French Open in 2011 and uh, he played final there. And uh, this was, for me, uh, the first time that that I realized how good he is. He lost uh, 10-8 or or I think 10-8 in the third set. He played at the same day when there was the men's final in the locker room. There was no one except the two finalists of the men's tournament and, and the two juniors. He finished, uh, he finished the year with winning second time Eddie Hare and winning uh, the Orange Bowl. He had a really successful junior career. In 2012, he started uh, to play uh, men's tennis. On the futures, uh, it's always difficult for young players who, which were very successful in junior tennis to succeed on men's tennis. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's more or less it's a different sport. Uh, it took him one and a half year. Then in 2013, he won he won challengers, and uh, in uh, January of 2014, uh, we decided that he only go for the big tournament. In February 2014, he was top hundred. This was the first time he beats he beats Jako Niminen, I remember, and then he was he was top hundred, and this was for us a milestone, you know, to have a kid who, who is first uh, the first time uh, top hundred is amazing, and I think this is the most important thing for a player when a player realizes or when a player believes that he can compete with the, with the best ones. Since uh, 2016, he's uh, He's top 10 and uh, I think or I, I, I hope that he will make some more, some more great wins. Tennis is a very, very expensive sport. When the kids uh, start playing tennis with six or seven years in some school project or in some kids project, it's not that expensive and uh, most of the parents uh, can afford it. But uh, as soon as they start playing tournaments, national, perhaps a little bit international tournaments with 11, 12 years, it becomes really, really expensive. I would say a career at the age of 12 years 
one year, I think, will cost around 25,000 euros. If you have a normal or an average salary, you cannot pay 25,000 euros every year for the career of, uh, of, your, of your kid, even if you have some more kids, so it's, it's not possible. The thing is that it's not getting better because if uh, the kids are 14, the season is around, I would say, 40,000. And then if you go under 18, if you play on ITF junior level, you have to calculate with, with around uh, 80 to, to 100,000 euros. For me, you have two possibilities. First, you have a federation which supports you. But there are not so many federations which have the ability to support the kids in, in such a way. I mean, you have the Grand Slam federations, you have some other federations uh, which have the possibility to support the players. And all these nations, uh, they have always very good players. The other possibility is uh, to, to get a sponsor, to get someone who believes in the kid, uh, who supports the kid who gives money to the kid. I mean, with Dominic, we were lucky because uh, we, had, uh, we had two investors, two sponsors, uh, which were believing in Dominic. Uh, and uh, so it was possible for us uh, to come through the ages between, I would say, 13, 12, 13 and 18. Or if you have a budget which makes it possible to, to make a tournament schedule, uh, which makes sense. This helps a lot to go uh, to go in the in the right direction or increase or develop the, to develop your your level. And uh, when you are through all these uh, junior uh, years and you start uh, playing on the on the on the professional tour, not so many things are changing because uh, if you're today top hundred then you can make a living from tennis. But if you are out of top 100, it's really, really difficult. And you have to play league matches. You have to play perhaps some national tournaments uh, to manage the budget of one year because it doesn't change, as I said before, uh, in the last years of the junior's career, also when you play on men's tennis and you have a coach and you're traveling, for sure, it, uh, it's, be it's between... Uh, uh, 80 and 100,000. So uh, if you play futures and you are ranked 400, 500, uh, you make uh, at least perhaps uh, 25,000 uh, price money and the rest you, you, you play some league matches, but uh, there is still a big part uh, where you have to, to try to, to get some sponsors, to have some partners or some federations, which makes it possible that you can travel. And this is a, this is a, this makes tennis uh, uh, very difficult. That uh, only I would say 100 uh, players in the world uh, have a living from from tennis. If the kids have good results in juniors tennis, so for example, if they are top 10 in tennis Europe under 14 or under 16, or if they if they succeed on the ITF junior tournament, then there is of course a good chance to find someone who will sponsor the young players. And in this age group, you will not find a, a closing company or a racket company who, who can support the, the players in such a way that they can go through the whole year. So you need some private sponsors, some private investors. And you know, you always have to find the right mix between developing as a tennis player, to develop all the parts, body-wise, technical-wise, mental-wise, and to play tournaments. If you take care to work on your technique and to work on your base, and you are not playing uh, enough international, international tournaments, then you have no ranking, and then you have no sponsors the, which can see you and which, which say, okay, this, this, this kid is good and uh, I, I would like to, to support them. So you always have to find the right mix between practice and, and tournaments. Another interesting topic in the career of a young tennis player is the role of uh, the National Federation. I think that in tennis, the National Federations are not uh, that important or don't uh, play that big role, like for example in football or in other sports. 
But uh, I think in general, it's important uh, to be in a good standing uh, with the federation. When kids start uh, or when juniors start playing in Tennis Europe, they have uh, the first uh, contact with their federation because they play these summer cups, they play these winter cups, they have one coach who is traveling uh, with the kids, with the young players to their tournaments. It's the same then in under 14, under 16. So beginning in this age, the national federations, they, they, pl they play a role in the career of young athletes. In general, in tennis, there's a, a big, there are big differences uh, between uh, the, the national federations. I mean, you have the big four federations, the Grand Slam federations, and then you have a couple of, uh, of other federations, like, uh, for example, Italy or, or, or Canada, uh, which have big tournaments, uh, uh, which have a good budget uh, to, to support uh, the young players. And I think this is, for me, the main role for a national federation to make something for, for the young athletes, uh, to support them, because, uh, as we said before, tennis is a very expensive sport. And uh, if the federations are able to support the players, uh, to give them the opportunities to go on international tournaments, to, to give them the opportunity to travel, to give them the opportunity to afford experienced, good coaches. If you, if you see, for example, the, the Austrian Tennis Federation, I mean, Austria is a small country. Uh, the Tennis Federation has, uh, has not, not a big budget. The structure of, uh, of the Austrian Federation is also not perfect organized. So I would, I would like uh, to see uh, that all these small federations, that they have a, a national center, Because the big ones, the big federations, they have a national center. They have also more centers where the, where the, where the players have, uh, have good conditions, where they can uh, practice uh, with other good players. Because this is one of the, of the most important points uh, in the career of young players. When you are 14, 15, you need other good players in your age group uh, with which you can compete every day, with, with which you can practice to go, to go up. Uh, because they force you to go to your limits. For example, as I said before, in Austria, they, they have not this national, this typical kind of national center. And this is exactly the, the problem. And I'm not a friend of this uh, individual support of the players. Because for me, as I said, it's so important to have a national center, to have good conditions there, to have good coaches there, to have good fitness coaches there, to have good physios there. And this is exactly the role of, uh, of the National Federation. There are two organizations uh, in the career of young tennis players. Um, first, uh, it's uh, the European Tennis Association. And uh, the second is uh, the International Tennis Federation, the Juniors Department. If the players start uh, playing international, they have the first contact with uh, Tennis Europe. Under 12, it's divided into under 12, under 14, under 16. And that's the first time to have the possibility uh, to compete on uh, international level. All these under 12 tournaments, uh, they are kind of invitation tournaments. The kids have the first time contact with, with, with kids from other countries. Very good for their experience. In under 14, this is for me, from my point of view, uh, the most interesting uh, age group uh, in Tennis Europe because uh, there are some tournaments uh, where players uh, from the whole world are coming to compete. And uh, I think the level, especially in uh, under 14 Tennis Europe, is, uh, is very high. I remember when, uh, when Dominic was playing under 14, it was uh, pretty tough for him to compete there. He finished... Uh, I think inside the top 40, but uh, he had not uh, really big results in this age group because there are so many differences. Some players, they uh, have the ability to concentrate. Uh, they, some other players, their body-wise already uh, taller. So uh, parents and, and, and coaches uh, always have this in your back and see uh, what is the difference. Why does the player... Why is the player successful or why is the player not successful under 14? Under 16, it's already a little bit different. The level is perhaps uh, 
uh, not that high because uh, the top players uh, under 16, uh, they go already to uh, ITF Juniors. Except there are there are two events, uh, three events. Uh, there are these winter cups under 12, under 14, under 16, the summer cups under 12, under 14, under 16, and uh, the European championships. So these events, you can compare a lot of players there. You can see a lot of players because the best players, they, 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 they compete for sure at the European championships. And uh, at the girls, perhaps in a little bit younger age, when they are 14, boys with, with 15, they start playing uh, these ITF junior tournaments. Uh, it goes until under 18. Uh, there are also a couple of different categories. It's difficult when you have no points to get accepted into the tournaments. In the end, I think uh, when, when you have uh, an okay level uh, with 15, uh, 14 as a girl, 15, 15 with the boys, I think you can start uh, playing ITF junior tournaments. Uh, try to make, uh, to make the first points. As soon as you have it, you can plan a little bit. From my point of view, uh, there's, only, there's only one target in the, in the ITF uh, junior tournaments to become a ranking uh, in the top 70 to compete uh, at, the IF, at the ITF uh, Junior Grand Slam tournaments. Because these are exactly the tournaments, uh, it, they, are, they are always held in the second week of the Grand Slam tournaments. It's the first time you have contact with the big players. It's the first time you have contact with uh, the top players in the world uh, to, to see all these facilities. And this is uh, such a nice uh, experience uh, for 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 young players, I remember when Dominic was playing his uh, his first uh, Grand Slam uh, tournament in Paris. It was amazing. I mean, so many people are watching there. It's it's really nice. And and uh, I mean, if you don't make it as a junior, still you have the experience uh, to play all these ITF junior tournaments. Yeah, there you 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 have uh, you have uh, tournaments in. All over the world, you have uh, you have super nice tournaments in in South America, uh, this Cossard circuit. You have hardcore tournaments in the states, so, so you have a lot of tournaments. But as I said before, the the goal has to be uh, to to compete uh, in the Grand Slam tournaments, and uh, this is the the first step uh, into into a possible international career. So, but now let's go on court and uh, we start practicing. So we are on court now, and uh, I will show you some drills with the forehand. So on the forehand, it's important to take the classical Eastern forehand grip. If we can see it here, okay, this is the classical Eastern grip. The player is coming from the side and has the racket like this. Okay, sometimes the kids have the tendency to go too much to the western grip. So take care and immediately turn it back to the eastern grip. So the classical eastern forehand grip is the best to get the solid serious technique. Uh, the most important thing on the, on the forehand is uh, the preparation of the racket. So that means you try to bring the racket back very, very early, the racket head looks completely back, okay? And now, please feed the ball and we will show, we'll try to swing, to swing the racket through. Okay, this is already very, very good. So now you try to use also your left arm a little bit, go back with your racket again, okay? And now, it's important that the left arm is always over the hip, okay? And now you swing through and you try to catch your racket with your left arm and to bring your elbow, your right elbow high up, okay? Okay, excellent. Please change. Okay, now we go, we take care a little bit about the hip because it's also important to get a good stabilization of the hip. Please come two, three steps forward. Okay, prepare with your, with your racket. So the racket head looks back, left arm is in front. And after the shot, you try that the heel of your right leg is touching the ground, okay? Okay, you see elbow a little bit more up, catch it here, and then that the heel is on the ground. 
The advantage of this is that we have a very good stabilization of the hip. If it doesn't work, we can make another exercise. Okay, so you feed again and after the shot, you try to stand only on your right leg. Okay, let's do, you can play very slow, racket back, left arm in front. Okay, you see if, the, if he's only on his right leg, he's a very good stabilization on the hip. So now, one more time where you try to hit, okay, and you fix it again, okay? But you try that the heel of the right leg is completely on the ground, okay? Excellent, excellent shot. You see, with this motion, you have a very good stabilization of your hip and you also have a very good swing and you have the spin. So with this motion, you have all the, the most important key points of the forehand you have included in, in, uh, in one motion. Okay, now you come, please. And now we make an exercise, you feed the balls, okay? They make one shot and they move around me, okay? And you try that after the shot, okay? So you hit the shot, hop, and you try that your right leg is only crossing behind, behind your left leg, okay? Okay? Okay, move, move, move. Again, hop. Perfect, okay? Let's go. Stop. Uh, with, this, with this crossing the right leg behind the left leg, yeah, you again, you take care that the hip is fixed. Okay? So that means with this motion, you don't turn the hip too early. Okay? You swing and then you cross behind. The next exercise is that you try to step in after the shot. Okay? So that means you hit, and after the shot, you step forward with your right leg and you, and, and you move to the middle. But you take care that your hip is not coming too early. Okay, let's go. Excellent. And, and you move back with side steps. Your elbow goes to your forehead. Excellent, and move back, move back, okay. Okay, excellent, excellent, excellent. So you see with this exercise, players have a very good swing plus a very good control. Okay, now we switch to the backhand. First, I will show you the key points of the two-handed backhand. It's important, as on the forehand, to swing back very, very early with the racket. The right hand should be the backhand grip and the left hand should be the forehand grip. Okay, so you go back very early with the racket and then, please feed the ball, you try to swing completely through. Stop. Excellent. Okay, you see, and it's important to bring both elbows up. It's similar to the golf swing. The right leg is a little bit bended, okay? And the left leg is touching the ground, so to get the stability in the hip. And now, the next exercise is, after this, that you step out with the left, okay, after the shot, and you make two, three side steps back to the middle. As soon as in the middle, you feed the next ball and we repeat the motion, okay? Keep the arms up, move back to the middle, okay? Excellent. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay, excellent. Okay, stop. So, one more exercise, which is very important, please come here, for the two-handed backhand, to give the players a feeling to use also the right and the left arm. So please prepare the shot, okay? And now, he tries to play a one-handed backhand, okay? You put your left arm to the heart of the racket and you try to hit a one-handed backhand, okay? Okay, excellent. Prepare again, okay? And you hit now a forehand with your left arm, okay? With the short grip. Right hand shows to the ball. Now he takes the short grip. He doesn't change the grip of the left arm on the racket and he tries to hit the forehand with the left arm, okay? Excellent, okay? And now he makes the combination. Now he's using both hands. Okay. Start, both hands, B hand, double handed backhand, okay? You go cross court. And you see with this exercise, the player gets a very good feeling to use also the right and the left arm. And now I will show you uh, the exercise where we repeat very fast. So that means you make a one-handed backhand immediately after 
you go back to the grip, bam, hit the forehand with the left, immediately after you hit the double-handed backhand. Excellent. Perfect. Double-handed backhand. Perfect. So now we'll show you some points, some key points of the one-handed backhand, please. Also on the one-handed backhand, the grip is the classical backhand grip, okay? And the racket goes back very early. So as on the forehand, as on the double-handed backhand, it's very important to prepare very early. So that means as soon as you see that the ball is coming on the backhand, you try to prepare and you try to adapt, okay? So racket back, a little bit, yeah, bravo, okay, you bend your right leg, okay? First of all, it's very, very important on the, on the one-handed backhand to swing, of course, the right arm through, but also that you make the motion back with the left arm. So when the right arm goes forward, you swing back with your left arm. And both arms are extended, okay? The weight is on the right leg, and the left leg is touching the ground to keep the balance. Okay. Okay, now we'll show you some exercises for the slice, for the volley, and then the combination uh, with slice and volley. Okay, so we'll start with the slice. The grip on the slice is between continental grip and backhand grip. It depends, it's different from player to player. And also, if the ball is higher, I can switch a little bit to the, the grip to the backhand. If the ball is lower, I can take a little bit more continental grip. So first exercise, you start, please. In the motion, in the, in, with the motion, your elbow is up, your left arm is up. Okay? And you start doing the, with, with this position, okay? Okay, one more time. Perfect, okay. It's similar to the one-handed backhand. It's important that the right arm goes forward, the left arm goes back. Okay, and to try to fix the wrist. So this would be a perfect position. One more time. Make it a bit faster. Okay, you see, stop. And as well also, the weight is on the right leg, the left leg is touching the ground to keep the balance. Perfect. So now take your second racket. Uh, come a little bit forward. Okay. You start with the position. Okay. And now you go with your right arm, you make the motion, you hit the ball. With the left arm, you go back. Okay. And you stand still after. Okay. It's important that he tries when the right arm goes forward at completely the same time the left arm should go back. Okay. Again. Perfect. Okay, another exercise to get more power in the left arm is to make the slice with the left arm, okay? And here the player can take a little bit more backhand grip with the left, so it's a little bit easier. Okay, perfect. So now we make the exercise where you make one slice with the right arm, up immediately after you change, okay? and you make a slice with the left. So that it gets a feeling to use both arms, okay? Excellent. Okay, perfect. So give me your second record, please. Okay. Uh, to make a little bit more stabilization of the hip, there's an exercise. Please go a little bit back. You hit the ball, and after, after hitting, you cross your left leg behind your right leg. So then we have, it's similar to the, to the forward exercise, that we have the stabilization of the left hip. Okay, start again. And also always take care that the right arm is bended, that you have something to extend, so you get the power from extending the racket. Okay? With this exercise, you have to guarantee that your left hip is more stable. Yeah. Okay? Now I will show you some borders. First exercise, you put your left arm behind your back, okay? The grip is continental grip, okay? 
racket is far in front. And one of the most important things on the volley is to step forward at the same time when you hit. So that means hit the forehand, step forward with your left leg. Hit the backhand, step forward with your right leg. Of course, the opposite when you are a left-hander. Very, very nice volley. Stop. You see? Okay, give me one forehand, please. And then one backhand and you keep the position, okay? Tap. You see? Very important. Racket in front. Step forward. Weight on the left leg. Very stable in the wrist. If a player has the problem that he's a little bit unstable in the wrist, there's a very good advice to take the grip a little bit shorter, okay? So let's try it. Take it a little bit shorter, okay? Because then you have more power, okay? Let's do it. Excellent, on the back end. Okay. Our next shot is the service. So I will show you some exercises about the service motion, not going too particular into the first serve or the second serve, but in general, the key points of the service motion. First of all, it's very important to check how the players are throwing the balls. Also, I give you the ball, okay, and you try to throw the ball. Okay. The motion is very similar. The throwing motion is very similar to the service motion. So if someone is throwing the ball very far, most of the times he has always very good service motion. Okay, excellent. So now you take your racket. The grip on the service is the classical continental grip. The left leg should be around 45 degrees, okay, from the baseline, and the right leg is parallel to the baseline. So we start with the right arm extended forward. The left arm is touching the racket at the heart of the racket. And it's important that it's, that it's a fluid, smooth motion back. So you start here and you show us one serve. The upper body a little bit more up. Was already much, much better. One more time. Start in front, excellent. This was perfect. Okay. Another very, very important point of the service motion is the toss. So now you take the ball, okay? You try to toss the ball and catch it without the service motion. You can give me your racket, I take it, okay? So you start with the left thumb in front of your body, okay? You touch your left leg, you toss it and you try to catch it, okay? Perfect, one more time. If he's tossing and he's catching the ball with the open hand, then it's fine, then it's fine, okay? So now we make the combination again. You start again, you try to toss it like now, and you fix the position after the serve. Stop, excellent. This is a very fluid, smooth motion, okay? There's one more exercise. Uh, if the player has some problems with the, with the toss, I always try to fix a little bit the position. So now you go, you go in this position, okay? Excellent, okay? And now you try to serve, okay? And you don't change the position. So if the toss is not accurate enough, the player cannot keep the position. So then automatically he gets the feedback that the toss was not good, okay? Let's try. You start in front, excellent. Okay, one more time. Then, sometimes I go behind the player because then I can see exactly where he's tossing the ball. The toss should be at around 12.30, okay? If you imagine a watch above the head, the toss should be around 12.30, okay? Perfect, you see, excellent turn. Right shoulder shows the direction where it's serving, upper body is up, the chin is up. And one more thing what is important, to turn the upper body, okay? So you go in a normal position now, okay? You serve, 
And after the surf, you try to step forward with your right leg. You surf, hop, you hit, you step forward. Okay? And then you stand still. This was excellent. If you want even more turning of your shoulder, of your upper body, there's an exercise. Start again, please. Okay? Where you surf and then you make a 360 after the surf. Okay? Excellent. You see here, the player has to turn his upper body. One more time. So this was our last episode, the surf. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, now it's time to go on court and to practice.